Hi, this is Mike Thornton from Pro Tools Expert, and this video is the first in a series on Oro 3D, recorded during my recent visit to the home of Oro Technologies in Belgium. It was also my first experience of listening to immersive audio in the Oro 3D format. Wow. <laughs> wow. That is incredible. You can just... You, it is like being in... It, it, it really does take that sort of difference between 2D and 3D because all that additional height, which even 5.1, it's still effectively just a, a flat circle. Absolutely. That, at that, the height... Um, it, I just, I just was in the concert hall, uh, and that's just absolutely spectacular. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, what I found most interesting was, it's the percussion elements, and it's, it's. You because that I suppose that's where you really hear the early reflections yeah. uh, and and the height yes uh, is off off all the production when the temps were sort of call and response and then the snare drum right at the end it just you that's when I really 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 became yes. aware of the of the additional height because also they are placed like I think at least uh, one and a half meter higher than mm. the violins for instance and I think. That's actually what I try to achieve, and which I think you can really notice that that you have three stages, that you, well four actually. You have the strings, then you have the woodwinds, brass, and percussion. And um, yeah, I think this room just becomes a concert hall yeah. when you, when you're when you're sitting here, you're, you're listening in this format. Well, I've just had an incredible experience listening to Oro 3D for the first time. A range of different samples. Classical orchestra recorded both here in the Galaxy Hall as well as in big concert halls, film score music, as well as some techno music. Amazing to hear the different types of music all being reproduced and really forgetting that there are any speakers in the room just being able to enjoy the music whatever the style whatever the format and here I am in the control room with a Neve 88D and Patrick you were responsible for all those uh, recordings that uh, I've been listening to uh, presumably both recording and editing and mixing right yes so let's take a look take a look at the classical to start with mm -hmm. um, how do you go about miking an orchestra because obviously with the 3D we've got the two layers we've got the lower layer and the upper layer so presumably they that that needs to be reflected in your miking technique are you still with an orchestra trying to mic relatively minimally i mean yeah if we drop back to stereo it, it might have been a cross pair with a couple of infills are you starting from that sort of premise yes indeed i do actually because um in the beginning, the idea is actually to have one microphone a speaker. Since in stereo you have two speakers, you can work with two microphones and make marvelous recordings if you have a good acoustics, if, if you have a good orchestra. Um, basically, that's what I do in surround as well, when I do film score recordings in just surround. 5.1. Yeah, 5.1, which is uh, two-dimensional sound, basically. Then I have uh, the standard Decca tree that you usually would use, uh, so you have left, center, right, LS, RS, five microphones, which make the basic sound. And in um, Oro 3D, which can be 9.1 or 10.1, or even more, uh, depending on what purpose it is for, um, it's the same principle. You will have, I would say, uh, generally, if I have a big orchestra, I go with a decatree technique, uh, have two surround microphones for the surround speakers, the, the lower surround speakers, and I then add four microphones for the height speakers. And that's basically it. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was just spectacular. You just hear the room. Well, you, you just hear the performance. You don't, you almost don't, you, yes, obviously you hear the room, but you just hear the performance. Uh, I, I was, I mean, I knew that the height, the height was going to add something to the recording, to, to, to the sound. 
but I was absolutely blown away by how much it adds just with it, c classical music never mind the creative opportunities that you might get in, in in other genres so moving on to the film music how do you amend your techniques to uh, to handle film score music well in film score uh, music it's a little bit different because basically when you record classical music at least my intention is to reproduce uh, as much as possible the uh, situation in the concert hall back at the listening position uh, whereas at f in film uh, score you basically want to support uh, the picture and the dialogue which is in the picture you don't want to uh, have um, the dialogue or the music um, push away the dialogue so basically this format in 3d helps me in that by uh, making it possible to to, ma to spread the sound make it as open, as transparent as possible, much more than in surround and in 5.1, I would say. Um, and in this way, having the dialogue present as a mono source, very, very um, distinct in, in the center speaker and creating a, a bed of sound, a sound sphere, I would say, or half a sphere uh, around the listener um, it, with music. And uh, I'm sure the same counts for atmospheres and uh, sound effects and stuff, but the atmos uh, will be spread around you uh, without you noticing every single speaker anymore, which you generally have the feeling that you have when you are uh, listening to 5.1 music or, or atmospheres that you have some, yeah, something from the back, something from the front, but it's not as if you were sitting in the sound. And that's basically um, what all 3D makes possible in, in music. Um, so basically, wherever you're sitting in, in a theater uh, watching a movie, uh, the music sounds not very localizable. It is everywhere, I would say, and gives you an envelope. And the, the dialogue still is in the center and, and is very prominent there, even if the music is quite loud in level. You can mix, basically the dubbing mixer can keep the music louder in a 10.1 or 11.1 mix uh, than in a 5.1 or 7.1 because you've got more space more localization exactly. with the height channel and the yes. the normal height and the normal lower one so in terms of uh, uh, processing um how much uh, eq and compression and uh, reverb have you needed to use on these recordings presumably the classical orchestra um very little very little indeed um uh, I must say the classical orchestra, the very first sample you he heard that was recorded in Galaxy Hall uh, has a little um, reverb, but it's actually only to extend the reverb tail. It's not so much to make the overall sound more wet or whatever. Um, because Almost just to make the room a little bit bigger. Exactly, because Galaxy Hall has a, a surface of 330 square meter, meters, I think. and. Um, Basically, for a large orchestra, as we heard, 75-piece orchestra, um, it's still a great hall, but it gets a little dry uh, at the end. So it's not like a concert hall where you have this uh, reverb tail, very nice uh, for classical music. Um, so I needed to add a little bit of that one, and uh, if I may say, it was a Lexicon 960. <laughs> interesting. Maybe you can cut Even this if you don't know. No, no, it, it's very interesting <laughs> that the the the. the, the yeah, as, as I've been around the studio here, I see a lot of, of older technology. I'm looking at the rack over there with some tube tech and uh, some uh, distressors. Very interesting. I was uh, only a couple of days ago uh, looking at a, a virtual demo of, of, the, of that very distressor. And there is one looking back at me, DBX160, <laughs> I can see. So still a lot of, uh, v well, nowadays, vintage technology. It uh, is, it is. And it, it's very interesting to see that you're using yeah, a, a Lexicon 960 uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a reverb. Um, presumably, when, we, when you start with the big concert hall recordings, very little, if any, it's the right microphones in the right place? That's actually my intention all the time. Is, um, in that particular recording that we heard with the saxophone piece, the taxi driver from uh, Burns Herman, there is no reverb at all, just on the solo microphone that is quite prominent, ver very big in front of the orchestra. I added some plate sound, this time from Precasti, <laughs> a little bit less uh, conservative. Um, but anyway, um, 
I think it's always been my, my intention to get the material a bit old fashioned maybe, but to get the material well on tape so that in the mixing on the desk, you don't need to apply too much processing anymore. And um, it's of course um, a little bit my advantage of being a resident engineer here at Galaxy and also uh, for the classical recordings in Brussels in the concert hall that we usually use for uh, bigger orchestra sessions uh, in Flagey Studio 4. Um, I know the rooms and I know which microphone at which position and which musician at which, at which position makes what sound. And uh, when I see a score, I can immediately say, okay, I have to place either the orchestra this way or the musician there in, in, on this particular spot in the hall, or I have to take this and that microphone. Of course, this can be tweeted and, and it's mm. not like the only truth, but... Uh, so what's, what's your microphone palette? Oh, microphone palette. Well, actually, it's, um, I must say, it's not so much vintage. Um, we are, um, of course, decatry. we're using uh, M150s instead of the old M50s, um, which basically have quite similar sound, but just are a little bit less uh, sensitive in terms of handling. Uh, then we've a lot of uh, Schöps microphones, Neumann microphones, <laughs> somehow we like the German brand. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of uh, vintage microphones, of course, um, but those are more the more special ones for uh, solo, micro for solo instruments or uh, uh, singers or whatever uh, special sounds you need. For the overall orchestra, I tend to use uh, modern condenser microphones just to avoid trouble mm. from like valves that <laughs> so, uh, in the middle of the recording like uh, give it up or <laughs> you know the trouble that you have if you have a big orchestra session and say oh hold on we have to <laughs> wait for five minutes because we need to change microphone cable whatever um, so there we go for safety and then for soloists where we have time then we can like um, use uh, vintage microphones mm. as well but sometimes even I ch rather choose the modern microphones because of it's a matter of taste in the mm. end. So how, what, is, what role does Pro Tools play in your work? Basically, Pro Tools is my main master tape machine. Um, well, tape machine and master machine. Um, I'm not so much using Pro Tools as a mixer, uh, neither um, for plugins or, or uh, other stuff, processing. It's just uh, a tape machine and all the mixing actually happens on the 88D console, uh, which is a 3D capable uh, console. I think it was so the you first do, one in the world. So you can actually do root, 3D routing on, yes. on the desk here. And panning as well, between all layers. It's wow. kind of a sphere panning that I can do with these two joysticks. One is then controlling the horizontal plane, and one is controlling height. So in, the in, in one run, I can actually have, uh, for instance, an airplane taking off uh, front left uh, speaker and going over you and, and disappearing in height rare surround speaker. Very nice. Yeah. And so moving on to the, some of the more, uh, the, the dance track that you played, how, how did you approach that in terms of um, the 3D sound? Because one of the things I noticed with, with the, the later examples that you played, is you resisted the temptation to overuse the rear channels. Was that a, a definite conscious decision? Yes, it was indeed. I mean, again, it comes a little bit from my um, intention that I always have to, to keep the sound as natural as possible. Of course, you can explore the possibilities of, uh, in the meantime, nine or ten speakers, um, by throwing things back and forth and, and making them move. And sometimes it does work. But as soon as I personally feel while mixing that this is too much, then I rather step, go st one step back. And um, it is in a way something um, born out of the vision that, especially for these um, later tracks, generally it is linked to picture. And um, so basically you have a fixed position where you're looking always to the front, to the screen, where either a video clip or a movie or whatever is, is going on. And um, maybe it's also coming from my main job as a film score mixer that generally you need to serve the picture by what you're mixing or how you're mixing the music. Um, so when you have things that are 
pointing out too clearly or like uh, suddenly appearing left heights around uh, which are not at all related to what is happening on the screen it will distract you so this might be one of the reasons why I don't overdo these kind of things but of course if I'm mixing for a, like sometimes you're mixing demo tracks uh, and then you need to show people what is possible and then I of course do some movements I do some flyover effects and I do answers like question and answer with front and back um, singers or yeah. lyrics or whatever uh, this and, and I think it works quite well uh, as soon as uh, as long as you keep it yeah keep it natural well, what about the uh, the top channel do you use that much in music or do you leave that to your film sound colleagues well actually I love that top channel for effects it's it's kind of for me a kind of a HFE I would say a height <laughs> <laughs> effects channel um, I generally leave it empty for a film score wh when I do film score mixings except for very special sounds but generally this one is used for the dub uh, like reserved for the dubbing mixer that he can put some effects in there um, different uh, story when I'm mixing film for video clips or whatever um, like you maybe heard uh, in the last example I have a voice coming out straight out of that uh, speaker um, now I have a little restriction from the developers or actually from the guys from Oro Technologies they say the home the com consumer market will be without that speaker because basically uh, uh, wives won't uh, <laughs> <laughs> want <laughs> yes. such a speaker just <laughs> on top of their uh, couch <laughs> so actually um, I'm it is quite important for me for punctual effects but it's not nothing you should fill with um, constant uh, Signals. Nothing you should actually mic up in a, uh, sur in, in a orchestra recording and put in there because mm. then the more it is filled with other stuff, the less it will be spectacular when there is a real thing coming out of there. It's just the same as a, as an LFE mm. in that yeah. way. Just yes, overuse. Then it doesn't. It loses its impact when Absolutely. you really need it. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to show me and to l and to play me these examples and for taking the time to talk about what you do. You're thank so you welcome. Very much My indeed. pleasure. Thank you.